Hello, everybody. Well, we're at uh, 1030, so I think we're going to get started very uh, quickly again. Uh, our chair for this session is Mark Hemmings. I'm not sure if uh, I don't see Mark's. Uh, there he is. Hi, Mark. Uh, thank you very much for chairing uh, the next session, which is Rail to Mexico. Mark uh, Hemmings is the president of Quorum Corporation and, of course, best known uh, in the industry, I believe, as the Grain Monitor. It's, he has served faithfully for over 20 years now. Um, also mentioned he is a past president of the CTRF, who is one of our sponsors. And welcome, uh, Mark, and I'll let you introduce the panel. Thanks a lot, Barry. Um, I'm just going to uh, try and share my screen here. We're talking about rail to Mexico. Um, of course, this topic is going to cover a, a little bit broader subject, but the context is, what does Mexico mean to Canada's grain sector? And I think it's uh, maybe surprising to some that Mexico is actually the fourth largest importer of Canadian grain at 2.3 million tons, um, behind the US, China, and Japan. Uh, we ship to over 100 different countries around the world. So being number four is, is a pretty predominant player in, in who we're selling our grain to. How does it get there? Or what, what do we ship? Well, a big portion of what we're moving right now is canola seed uh, and canola products. Well over half of what, what moves. There's also special crops, the wheat in Durham, and then other cereals that are moving. So it, it, is, it, is, a, it is a big market for the canola uh, industry, um, something that'll be even more important in one of the following topics to, in today's conference. Now, how does it get there? Now, only 13% right now moves by rail, uh, which is going to make the, the presentation in particular that's given by John Harmon uh, even more interesting because this new route that will come with the CPKCS merger could likely provide a greater amount of uh, opportunities to move by land because the majority of all of our uh, exports to uh, Mexico is going by ocean freight. So that's, that's probably an important um, factor in what we're talking about today. So we have three, we have three uh, people talking today. Uh, our first is going to be Kevin Cully, who's with the Caxwar Group, um, just going to unshare here. Um, Kevin, Kevin is uh, is a senior executive management professional with a reputation that is strong, a results driven leader, um, and a mentor and a collaborative team player who motivates his staff. He has over 20 years of proven decision-making experience, developing strategic solutions, and increased cost effectiveness and efficiencies across a wide array of market sectors. He's also the recipient of the Business Leaders of Edmonton Award, Strathcona, Biz, Strathcona County Business of the Year Award and the Strathcona County Economic Diversification Award, fellow Albertan, obviously. And uh, I'll welcome Kevin to the conversation. Kevin, uh, it's all yours if you want to share. Well, first off, everyone, it is an honor to be here. I am virtually attending from Mexico, but I assure you that we are working while we're down here. And I feel for everyone back home in the snowstorms in Alberta. But being able to represent both the Caxor group, being able to present the uh, represent the Caxor group as well as present the team at Corridor Project is truly an honor. And as we start here, um, for anyone wondering what the TMEC stands for, it is the treaty. For anyone wondering what the TMEC does stand for, it is a treaty between Mexico, United States, and Canada, also known as the USMCA agreement. And for the TMEC corridor itself. Quite simply, it is a major infrastructure development project that will start in Sinaloa, Mexico and terminate in Winnipeg, Manitoba. The TMEC corridor project is a privately funded project and we, and we truly do aim to eliminate some of the inefficiencies in current North, North American trade infrastructure as we've already discussed. 
What we see here is some of the key participants. Around the globe, there are three geographical areas that are trending towards trade, con trade consolidation. This consolidation is being driven by price competition, production capacities of each region and transportation costs. In 2019, trade volume was one point, sorry, USMCA trade volume was $1.17 trillion. That equates to only 15.9% of global trade totals. The total current estimated potential trade within the Americas alone is $22.5 trillion. The USMCA agreement has spawned opportunities to eliminate supply side constraints and to also provide additional distribution network opportunities. In 2018, only 1.4% of our exports were destined for Mexico and only 6.2% of Canadian imports originated in Mexico. Mexico, of course, also imports goods. An example, as we've discussed before, is soybeans. Soybean imports into Mexico for 2021 are forecasted to be at 6.1 million metric tons. However, the Mexican soybean production remains at 250,000 metric tons. It's also important to note that this project, the TMEC corridor, is not being driven by the Canadian nor the American side of the equation. For Mexico, the US East Coast and Canada represent huge market potential for its products. And for Canada and the US, Mexico represents an opportunity to access goods currently being produced from China and other Pacific Rim countries. The TMEC corridor project will provide greater supply security and open the continent to the free flow of products in all directions. In essence, the TMEC corridor intends to transform the Pacific Basin transport seascape. 2000, 2021 has revealed global supply chain weaknesses that are translating into prices that us as consumers have, have never seen. Our California ports are saturated, the tanker freight is backed up, shipping and ports currently handle 80% of global merchandise trade by volume and 70% by value, as we've already heard from other speakers. The TMEC corridor project will provide shippers with new options to access the Pacific coast and with north-south intercon interconnectivity to existing ground transport networks. This slide that we are currently seeing represents a high level overview of what the Mexico portion of this project will entail. This project will transform the Port of Mazatlan into the most efficient container handling facility on the planet. Our development will occur over three phases. The initial phase providing capacity for 4 million TEUs per year. In 2031, this will be at 6 million TEUs per year. By 2036 and upon the third phase completion, our total seaport capacity will be 8 million TEUs per year. From Mazatlan, enhanced rail connectivity will now connect the state of Sinaloa to the state of Durango. This will now fuel the construction of four new logistics centers. They are located in Durango, Lerdo, Fonterra, and Nava. This will open efficient rail and road freight flow into the Southern United States, as well as to points north. The title on this slide could very easily read, TMEC corridor, Winnipeg to Sinaloa. The northern terminus is planned to be located within Winnipeg, Manitoba, and this project truly will create a game-changing two-way freight network. This will be accomplished with rail and highway upgrades through the Sierra Madres that we, that we just spoke of that were currently forecasted, forecasted to cost 320 million US dollars. One key aspect of our project that does not garner a lot of attention in Canada is that this opens up new north to south rail and road connectivity to Central and Southern America. In 2020, our largest South American trading partner was Chile. We exported $732 million worth of goods. South America will unlock substantial opportunity for Canadian products in the future, and TMEC Corridor has a potential to unlock overland access into these markets. Looking at our wet port that will be built in Mazatlan, this overhead view of the port illustrates the grand scale of the undertaking at hand. 
The area in blue on this diagram is the Pacific Ocean. The pier in this diagram shows two berthing bays with overhead bridge cranes. Roads and tracks are designed to optimize traffic flow and to minimize any and all delays. To try to imagine how large of a scale of a project this is, on that diagram, those are railroad tracks with ample radius to turn 180 degrees on the port platform itself. An additional view of the port with the fixed container terminal is shown here. Dual transfer train tracks are shown in the lower right in illustration. On shore will be a container storage, custom service, logistics, and administration facilities. The port and shore will then be connected by a causeway that crosses the ocean into shallower waters. As we look at our ship to train interface, between the pillars of the overhead cranes, we will have two trains in parallel on rails to transfer car cargo directly, as indicated by the red arrows on our diagram. The design includes placement of 15 bridge cranes to simultaneously serve each boat moored within the canal. Each bridge crane will then contain two hoists. Each ship will then have 30 cranes available to transfer containers simultaneously. The deep water port itself will be located in Dimas, 72 kilometers north of Mazatlan. This strategic location will, will, will allow us 18 meters of draft and will allow more moorage of the largest ships in the world. You may have noticed already that we are not bringing the ships into the harbor. Instead, we are designing and engineering our harbor to be taken out to the ships itself to minimize any and all environmental impact as much as possible. In order to achieve the efficiencies designed into each port, one of the attributes of our port will be the twin lift system where two containers will be hoisted simultaneously. Seaport will have the capacity to handle 300 containers an hour and unload 7,200 containers in a single 24 hour period. Currently, the largest ship in the world is the MCS Gulson. This ship has a total payload of 23,964 TEUs. Ships of the future are being anticipated to be in excess of 30,000 TEUs. Our port, Seaport, is being designed with this in mind and we will have the ability to accept all cargo ship capacities. An interesting point to note on this slide is the bottom seven ships identified on this slide are very challenged to navigate the Panama Canal. As we look at the busiest ports in the world, and if the significance of an additional Pacific Coast port has not been made abundantly clear, and if not, my apologies, this illustration may help. The Pacific Basin sees the largest volumes of freight flow on the planet. In comparison, and in 2019, Vancouver saw a record volume of 3.4 million TEUs. And in fact, if we take the five busiest ports in Canada, being Vancouver, St. John, Halifax, Montreal and Port Rupert added together only total 6.3 million TEUs. Upon completion, Seaport will rank number 20 of the top 20 wet ports in the world. What we see here are some quick numbers and some quick metrics showing Mexico's identified market potentials within Canada and the United States specific to advanced technical products. Getting these products, as well as the products on the following slide to market, is a catalyst of this undertaking. Currently, within Canada, one half of our agricultural imports come from the United States. However, this slide indicates and represents farm products available from Mexico. What we see here is the rail and road network linking the state of Durango to the state of Sinaloa. The purpose of these upgrades is to support the transport of up to 8,000 TEUs per day. Section three as identified in red will have an average slope of 2.4% and in 140 miles of existing highway between Durango and Mazatlan, 
you will encounter 115 bridges, 61 tunnels, 2,000 hairpin curves, and a drop in 6,000 feet in elevation. Some data on what the rail rehabilitation and upgrades through the Sierra Madres will look like upon completion is we will have a combined total of 96 kilometers of tunnels and 75 kilometers of bridges and trestles. Once we are through the Sierra Madres, existing rail networks will provide access to most major Eastern US and Canadian centers. The current illustration that we're, that we're looking at now shows a freight flows from Mexico routing through the United States and into Canada with Winnipeg, Toronto and Montreal as the three major destination centers. We have already previously seen where the four new logistics yeah, parks will be located exactly. along the TMAC corridor. Durango, Lerdo, Nava and Fonterra. Other facilities such as the Sinaloa Aerospace Park, a port within Texas, a port within Florida and a port within Manitoba will also be developed to take advantage of these trade opportunities. Looking specifically at the Sinaloa Aerospace Park, the location of this facility is 10 kilometers north of Mazatlan, Sinaloa. We began construction in December of 2020 with development over two phases. Phase one is currently 60% construction complete. Upon completion, this facility will have the ability to provide full air freight capabilities including Antonov jet size cargo, as well as manufacturing capabilities. The vision of the Sinaloa Aerospace Park is to be the leading mixed use aerospace industrial complex in Latin America. As we specifically look at Winnipeg, and one question I, I'm asked no matter where I go upon my travels is why Winnipeg? As shown here, Winnipeg is the most strategic location within North America for a project such as a TMEC corridor. It is also important to note that by 2040, Mexico will require transportation infrastructure to manage 25 million TEUs per year. By the same time in 2040, the TMEC project will be able to provide for 8 million TEUs, which equates to only 32% of just Mexico's requirements. As the slide says, and as we've discussed, and as we all know, our ports are busy, our tankers are backing up. Nearshoring is code for consolidation of regional trade. Consolidation of regional trade is a reality, and it does make sense, both from a cost perspective and as well as from a risk perspective. North America has unfortunately trailed other regions. So ladies and gentlemen, I would submit that Seaport and the TMEC corridor will open markets and opportunities for Canadian farmers, producers, shippers, manufacturers, and transporters. This will also afford Canadian consumers additional supply options and greater price competition. On behalf of Caxor Canada and behalf of myself, it has been an honor. I wanna thank you for this time. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Uh, that's really interesting and an incredibly impressive uh, piece of work. Uh, just want to mention that we're going to leave the questions till the end of the, the presentations, and then we'll bring the group back together, much the same as session one. Our next speaker is Diane Gray. Uh, Diane is founding president and CEO of Centerport Canada. It's a 20,000 acre trimodal inland port, foreign trade zone in Winnipeg's capital region. Ms. Gray previously worked for the province of Manitoba from 1995 to 2009 and simultaneously served as Deputy Minister of Finance, Deputy Minister of Federal, Provincial and International Relations, and the Deputy Minister of Trade. She's received the Lieutenant Governor's Medal for Excellence in Public Administration the Women of Distinction Award for Management and Leadership and was recognized by the Supply Chain Management Association as one of the 100 influential women in Canadian supply chain. Ms. Gray currently serves as the chair of MITAX in the Manitoba Technology Accelerator and is the co-chair of the World Trade Center in Winnipeg. 
In addition, Ms. Gray serves on the boards of UN Properties, the Public Policy Forum of Canada, the Canada West Foundation, and the Associates of the Asper School of Business. Ms. Gray is a graduate of the University of Manitoba's and University of Winnipeg's Joint Masters of Public Administration program and has an undergraduate degree in political studies. Diane, thank you for coming, and we look forward to hearing your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you, Dr. Prentice, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to give you, I guess, kind of the, the snapshot on what is at that northern end of the corridor, the, the TMEC corridor, as Kevin Cooley referred to it as, um, and that's Centreport Canada. Um, so we market ourselves as an inland port project, and for those in the United States and Mexico, inland ports are far more common than what has emerged so far in Canada. But in essence, an inland port is a space, a, high, a highly developed industrial space that's connected to multiple modes of transportation. And a lot of focus on this conference regarding supply chains, but ultimately those multiple modes of transportation are tools that companies use to help manage those supply chains. And there's obviously trade-offs in terms of cost competitiveness and efficiency in how they do that. Uh, but it's about providing that space where companies can access them all from a single location. So Centreport Canada, um, just a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we were created um, back in 2009 and it's a physical space that's been designated for strategic, uh, both hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure supports. And it's 20,000 acres in size, uh, anchored by the James Armstrong Richardson International Airport in our southeast corner, um, and on-site trimodal access. And, and over the last decade or so, we've been really focused on getting that core infrastructure right and that has included uh, planning, it has included um, various uh, expressways, services, utilities, as well as some of that soft development support that I'll tell you a bit about. And the overall goal is essentially uh, to create a space that helps differentiate Manitoba and our capital region um, from other communities in terms of investment attraction. Uh, in addition, it takes advantage of our central geographic location in the center of North America, as well as those transportation assets. Centerport's uniquely planned as a sustainable uh, development approach to our complete community. Um, we have every project that builds within Centerport achieves sustainable development points. There's a variety of ways they can do that. It ranges from how they build their building, how they manage their sites in terms of drainage, um, but and also um, the type of mode of transportation they select to primarily ship by with rail being the lowest GHG emitting form of transportation available within Centerport. We also offer single window access uh, to the federal government's foreign trade zone like programs and we're supported through that with now it's uh, Prairies Can, uh, what used to be Western Diversification. So you saw this map on Kevin's slide. Um, that's, that's what Winnipeg looks like. And he talked about that strategic location just in terms of Caxor's approach to that rail connectivity uh, from Mexico straight up into Canada. And we're also going to hear more from John Harmon um, specifically about what CP's acquisition of Kansas City and Kansas City, Southern Mexico in terms of um, that location, but certainly the inland port and specifically a project that we're developing within the inland port called the Centerport Canada Rail Park um, feeds into that geographic location. But our location is also important when you listened and heard what Doug Mills from the Port of Vancouver had to say in terms of the congestion and the lack of industrial space and land that is around the ports uh, in the ocean areas. And so there is an opportunity to be able to not only move some of that distribution internally into the country um, for the purposes of break bulk, but also for staging purposes so that uh, transload and other activity doesn't always have to take place right at the ocean port. 
So Centerport, um, by virtue of having 20,000 acres, allowed us to really think about this project from more than just an industrial play. But we were able to work with um, the inland port projects that were developed in the United States, some of uh, the most well known of Center Point, which is in Elwood, Illinois, uh, Alliance in Fort Worth, and uh, Smart, um, uh, the Kansas City Smart Port people, and and um, and down in Mexico as well with some of the projects there, and some of the lessons learned uh, that we took away from that included thinking about the whole project from the company's perspective and what they need in order to be able to make a site decision. And so in addition to those logistics and transportation options, there's also a concern over how far um, your skilled workforce and your labor is going to have to travel in order to get to your point of business. And so as part of the complete community, we've incorporated a 500 acre residential community that's completely buffered from the industrial development outside of the noise enforcement contours of the airport and it backs onto an existing residential neighborhood within the city of Winnipeg and so that will allow up to 8,000 employees to be able to live right on the Centerport campus and um, many of whom will be able to find jobs right on the site. Talked a little bit about our sustainable development approach. Uh, we've protected parks, we've protected green space, um, there's active uh, transportation components being incorporated right into the project so that bikes aren't competing with trucks on our roadways and, and they'll have uh, their own separate corridors. We have partnerships with our post-secondary institutions. Red River Polytech uh, is located right on the footprint. We also have a partnership with Manitoba Institute for Trade and Technology and we work very closely uh, with our university partners as well. Um, the former uh, president of the University of Manitoba, David Barnard, is on the board of directors for Centerport. And um, there's also obviously our support for the companies that locate here. We have over 100 new companies that have made Centerport their home, uh, particularly since 2018 when full services and infrastructure were in place. So this is basically what our land use uh, and development planning map looks like. Centerport straddles two municipalities. So what we call Centerport North falls within the arm of Rosser. And so you can see that dark blue dashed line on the screen. Uh, everything north of that is in the arm of Rosser. South is in the city of Winnipeg. And uh, we've referred to that as Centerport South. Um, and in the southeast corner there, you can see the federal crown lands that make up uh, the Winnipeg Airport Authority's campus, and they have the primary responsibility for managing the development of those Government of Canada lands. Now, the areas that are in, um, in uh, darker blue represent projects that are already underway, and in some cases, those are large industrial parks that are up to 240 plus acres in size. And that includes Brookport Business Park, Brookside Business Park, uh, Brookside Industrial Park West. You can see some of those developers um, need a marketing person to come up with some new catchy names. Uh, Inksport Business Park, Steel Business Park, um, and it carries on. There's also some large single user new projects uh, that are either in development or those land or those uh, companies have bought land in order to do projects. Uh, Patterson Global Foods is, has both an inland terminal on site and fertilizer distribution facility, but under construction right now is an oat processing facility, and that's a $94 million project. Uh, in addition, Imperial Seed, which is um, what, one of Western Canada's largest seed testing facilities and distributors, uh, has a 30 acre campus on the footprint. Uh, in addition, Bison Transport has acquired about 475 acres of land to do its new North American corporate headquarters and a logistics campus around it. You can see in the darker green, um, the residential side, and you can see how it is buffered. Uh, in over on the air side uh, strip, there's 275 acres of new air side industrial that the Winnipeg Airports Authority has in the planning stages for the next five years. Um, and the area that is in 
kind of, I'll call it um, goldenrod, uh, is our Centreport Canada Rail Park. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that um, in some detail in a minute. So about our trimodal logistics and, and what helps to distinguish our community, um, the first is rail. And uh, obviously, we, we've heard a lot about rail um, from Kevin Cooley. We're going to hear more about it from John Harmon. I won't touch uh, too much on it, except that Winnipeg uh, is the only major city on the Canadian prairies that is served by three class one rail carriers, uh, CN, CP, and Burlington Northern Santa Fe. The CP Main East West line across Canada runs right through Centreport, and uh, the rail park that is under construction will could also um, uh, shippers could also access CN and BNSF services through the federal interest switching rules and rates. Winnipeg is a major international trucking hub. A uh, number of large trucking companies are headquartered in our city. Um, I mentioned buys and transport already. Uh, Transex, which is owned by CN Rail, is also headquartered at Centreport. About 70% of Manitoba's trucking industry is now at Centreport Canada. And uh, some pre-existed the development of the inland port, but we've had a, a location of many new ones over the last few years. And then just a little bit about our airport campus and why we're excited that the airport's authority is going to be shifting a lot of its cargo operations over to its west side, new west side campus. And that is because Winnipeg and its central geographic location actually supports the most dedicated cargo freighter movements of any airport in Canada. There's about 28 um, cargo freighter flights that come in and out of Winnipeg every single day. Um, and we are re, uh, we're that central Canadian redistribution hub for a number of those carriers, including Canada Post, um, but also FedEx and others. One of the soft supports that we put in place at Centreport is fast track land development. And we did that with partnership with the province of Manitoba and our municipal partners in the arm of Rosser. And we created Centreport North as a special planning area. Um, I'll just cut to the bottom line and what it offers not only is cost certainty to new companies coming, but also uh, time efficiency. And those are really important to the bottom line of many companies. So for full subdivision and rezoning, which can occur concurrently, uh, it's about three months. And, and building permit turnarounds are really fast as well, about two weeks on average. But Centerport, um, we're not your standard large scale distribution hub that you would see in Alliance or in Elwood, Illinois. Um, those inland ports are attached to major urban centers. So we really focused on economic sectors that aligned very closely with the economic strengths of Manitoba. And obviously for uh, the purposes of today's presentation, agribusiness and food processing um, is key among those. And a number of the new companies that have located at Centerport uh, actually fall within this sector. So it, it's obviously critical to us. And that sector relies very heavily on transport, as all of you in this conference would be well aware. There's a number of industry leaders at Centerport. I've mentioned a few of them here today, um, but uh, there is a sizable aerospace industry within Centerport, agricultural uh, equipment manufacturing, among others. So uh, some of the results, what are we seeing right now and on the ground? Well, there's a number of new exciting projects that are that have either just been completed or are under construction. The National Research Council's new advanced manufacturing facility is due to open early 2022. And um, this will provide support not only to our, our pure manufacturing industry, but also the food processing and production industry, including in uh, new material packaging for them. The new Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada uh, is nearing completion. I had a tour a few weeks ago. It's absolutely fabulous. It's adjacent to our passenger terminal now. It's very close. So when you come to Winnipeg, make sure you take the time to actually visit that museum. I believe it'll be open to the public early in 2022. Merit Functional Foods has constructed the very first canola protein processing facility. 
uh, I'm told in the world. Um, they, it's also doing P fractionization at this facility. They're producing a water soluble protein that is sold to Nestle Corporation for protein beverages. And uh, that facility opened about 12 months ago. Uh, it, the, the owners of that company already have plans to expand and take on new business lines. And this is obviously in addition to the large um, Rockettes facility that was built in Portage Little Prairie. Uh, I just flagged that because there, there is a growing cluster of new protein facilities that are being located uh, in Manitoba. Uh, I touched on O Foods, which is Patterson Global Foods new oat processing facility that's under construction. Uh, Four Tracks Trucking Company has, is in the process of building a new corporate headquarters. Uh, and Nutrien, a Saskatchewan fertilizer, um, an agribusiness company, is has uh, just is is in the process of constructing with a third-party developer a new distribution facility within Centerport. So that's just a few of some of the main main projects that are under construction or have just taken place. Um, but we've sold uh, we've we've sold about two thousand acres now of the total footprint. Um, so now the rail park really excited project that takes into account a lot of what's happening in the supply chain um, and provides a really different unique real estate project for companies that manage part of their supply chain by rail. It's 665 acres in size um, and uh, we went to market back in late 2018 to attract a developer for this project uh, we selected a developer. Uh, we closed with that developer in uh, early 2020, and then the pandemic hit. Um, so that slowed down uh, the start of construction, but the developer is on target to start construction in the spring of 2022. Now, what makes this unique? Um, it is about co-locating companies that manage part of their supply chain in the same space and providing spur line service right to the company site. And this creates an efficiency of scale for the railroad. Um, and in this case, the main line is CP's main line, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but it also creates an economy of scale for the companies locate, locate there because they can share that infrastructure. Um, the anticipation and, and work is underway to have an on-site uh, switcher that will help bring those cars uh, right to the site of those companies. It's already been rezoned for heavy industrial use, but our zoning in Centerport is inland port specific, which actually supports a mix of uses. Um, so the kind of companies that we expect to locate there and that are in the process of making location decisions would include everything from advanced agribusiness um, companies through food processing to chemical companies um, and others. So it'll be, a, it'll be a mix and a range, but with the common expectation that they manage part of their supply chain by rail um, for most of that 665 acres. The other thing about this project um, is that there is expressway road connectivity on both the eastern side of the project as well as the western side. So we have Centerport Canada Way, which is a four lane expressway, uh, RTAC. It has long combination vehicle access at both um, off of it into the rail park and onto our west perimeter highway. And that allows for uh, trucks to move rapidly in to the project as well as out and get out into our trade corridors and head east, west, or south. Um, so I, I mentioned a little bit about this. There's a variety of real estate uh, opportunities connected to this, but we feel that um, the time is right. The market is certainly responding uh, with a lot of interest to this type of a project. And there is, and I'm very interested to hear from John Harmon personally, uh, but there's a lot of interest and chatter around what the CP acquisition means in terms of that single line that will serve Canada, US and Mexico right up and down the corridor. 
and what other opportunities will be presented because of that. And Kevin Cooley certainly talked about some of those in terms of the potential to import more from Mexico using the rail line. Um, and I know Dr. Prentice in the past and I have talked about the potential to do a lot more uh, in the, in the uh, frozen and refrigerated um, space um, should, should there be demand for that. So just in closing, um, we're seeing you know, good uptake in terms of interest in this project. And uh, there's, I, you know, I, I think really that effectiveness of having that hard infrastructure combined with some of the soft supports is what really has helped to differentiate us a bit. But ultimately, um, you know, the, the results are in terms of the companies locating there and uh, what, they're, what they're doing in terms of transforming the types of logistics demand uh, that we're seeing in our marketplace. So I will close there. Thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what's happening at Centerport and how it connects to this conversation with Mexico. Thanks very much, Diana. Much appreciated. That was a really good presentation as well. So I'm going to take the chairs. Uh, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and ask the first question. I see that Barry's got a few questions to ask as well. If anybody else has questions, uh, I would ask that you put them into the chat session and either send them to me explicitly or to the group, and we'll work to try and uh, get through all those questions. I guess we've got just about half an hour, Barry. Barry's nodding. So my, my question is for Kevin. Um, you, you, that was an excellent presentation. Um, I found it incredibly interesting. I'm wondering, uh, have you guys kind of settled on a timeline? When, when do you think that things are gonna start moving? Is it the rail line that has to start the process or is it something that's gonna to happen together? So at this stage right now, the Sinaloa Aerospace Park on phase one, we're 60% complete. The, the, the dry port within Durango, we're, we're, we're well into construction at that phase. Detailed engineering on rail, as well as the wet port in Sinaloa are underway. And I've had the pleasure of working with Diane and her team over the past few months. And uh, we're, we're completing and finalizing our Canadian master plan right now. Sounds promising. Um, next question, this one is from Barry and it's for Diane. Uh, have you been receiving more interest from potential Mexican businesses as a result of these improved rail connections? Great question. Um, I would say we're at the start of communicating and figuring out a strategy of how best to position uh, the Mexico link opportunity to Centerport. And we're going to work closely with Caxor and, and others on that. Um, the, we, we've spent a fair bit of time in the past looking at opportunities of how to improve the supply chain on fresh fruits and vegetables in particular from Mexico to Canada. Uh, I, I'm not sure who mentioned it earlier. Um, it it might've been you, Kevin, but but a significant amount right now of fresh fruits and vegetables um, come, we, we import them in Canada from the United States. We don't import directly from Mexico. And so there's a lot of touch points um, before they, they make their way to Canada, which not only decreases freshness, but it drives up the overall cost of the product. So I think there's some opportunities there and, and we've had connections previously and we built some of those relationships. Um, but that's not to say that there isn't already product moving south from Manitoba to Mexico and, and product moving from Mexico into Canada. Uh, certainly Patterson Global Foods, which exports out of Centerport, um, ships south. And some of that is going is into, into Mexico and, and, and into South America, actually, from here. Uh, we're also major pork exporters out of Manitoba. Um, down to Mexico. And, and so there is right now, we know refrigerated containers that are moving south that I think there's opportunity to do something more around with a streamlined rail, a rail existence. So 
we're, we're just starting to build that strategy um, and build on some of the knowledge we've had previously, but we want to work with our partners like Caxor and CP and others to be able to make that case quite convincingly as, as we unfold it. Thanks, Diane. Um, and that kind of leads into the next question, which is for John, which is, does the single line service make it more desirable or feasible to move refrigerated goods between rail or by rail between Canada and Mexico? Your thoughts? Well, full disclosure, I'm on the bulk side, not the intermodal side, but um, single line haul uh, definitely helps the speed of transit. Uh, I tend to think, I always use an analogy, whenever railroads interchange, it's like an airplane taking off and landing and then having to take off and land again. So there's always some incremental cost and time delay whenever you have to, to switch railroads like that. But when you're one railroad, you can have visibility to the supply chain all the way through and your service design team and asset management team can plan further out and enabling a smoother transition and smoother transit all the way through. So there are some opportunities there. We are willing to explore every opportunity you all want to bring. <laughs> uh, next question is uh, from, uh, well, George. All three presentations indicate a Western-centric focus and potential growth is astounding. But when implemented, will it reduce the activities in Eastern Canada? And have you seen any resistance to the plan from either Ottawa or Montreal? Uh, questions kind of open to everybody. Who wants to start? I'll pick on you, Diane. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that there is resistance per se. Um, I, I don't think Centerport is specifically about competing with Montreal and with Ottawa. Um, Probably, um, you know, Mississauga is a large, it's a large distribution center. And I think I mentioned earlier that we really aren't positioning ourselves to be national uh, distributors. Um, but, but that also then supports what's happening with the regionalization of supply chains. And so where, where I'll say the distri distribution economy was 10 years ago is not where it is today. And it's not likely where it is to be with the continuing growth in e-commerce, e which is much more regional uh, and time sensitive. So I, I think for that, we're well-placed, but then so too are other Canadian cities to the east of us. So I, I like to keep my head down a little bit and try not to aggravate um, other communities too much. I think there's, there's uh, you know, when I when I have the opportunity to talk to other communities, and, and I'll, I'll be fair, most of those are in Western Canada, uh, I think there's lots of scope and room for other communities to be able to invest in strategic infrastructure and provide supports to companies and businesses um, to locate there. And uh, I, you know, that would benefit Canada as a whole. Uh, as opposed to just our capital region. And obviously as a Canadian, I would like to see that. Um, so there's, there's some lessons learned here for sure, um, but I, I don't actually see pushback. Thanks a lot, Diane. John, you, you have something to add there. Uh, I, I would build on this and say, we, we definitely have growth plans in the East as well. I mean, we just purchased the CMQ and we're, we fully integrated that. And so we're continually looking for new business out that direction as well. We see the, you know, CPKCS vertical integration up and down north south as a attack onto that as well. Kevin, anything to add? I think from our point of view, we're really looking at this TMEC corridor project as strengthening North America's supply chain. And it's not about Mexico, it's not about United States or Canada individually. We're, we're really looking at this from, from a, a very large point of view where we're once complete, we, we can help strengthen the supply chain within North America as a whole and not, not regional specific. It's kind of, it's kind of our, our answer to the Silk Road, I suppose, if you were gonna draw an analogy. Uh, next question is from Kareem. Cabrera, uh, Kareem, if you could unmute and ask your question. Hi, thank you. Um, 
it, this is for Kevin. Uh, we definitely know that tax group in, in, in Mexico has a uh, reach for the Durango government to see some of the infrastructure and rehabilitation of the railway, which is a very important uh, matter in, 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 in the project. Uh, have you reached Mazatlan's government also? So can can help and can provide more information or uh, from other projects to the TMEC uh, corridor? Yes, absolutely. We we're, we're really fortunate to be working with governments such as the state of Sinaloa, as well as the state of Durango and Coahuila, and then we, we have a really productive working relationship with all three governments and all conversations to date have been really positive and and we're really seeing the both, both the at the federal level as well as the state level embrace this project and really realize what what uh, what this project will accomplish once complete great uh, my question was because uh, uh, this is a very important matter for us I work for the Mazatlan government actually and we are very interested in, in getting involved and help this uh, infrastructure uh, project that um, enhance our connectivity and our geopolitic, if you could, if you could mention. So we just want to raise our hand that we are really interested in being part of it and help as much as we can to make it happen. No, oh, absolutely, Kareem. And uh, very pleased to share my information with uh, Kareem directly. And then, Kareem, I'm here in Mexico sure. for, for a little bit longer and we can connect directly. Sure, that would be great. I really appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question. This one is from Paul Miller. Uh, and this is for Diane. Is it intended to have a rail truck intermodal container, container terminal at the rail business park? question and the short answer is maybe um, <laughs> because it uh, at the rail park as it develops um, is the responsibility of the developer so we help to facilitate the project and get it initiated but as it starts construction um, ultimately uh, the developer will lead that project and what I can say is they have land set aside to potentially do that, um, but we'll see how that unfolds. Thanks, Diane. Um, just going back, um, got some questions here that I missed. Um, this is for John. Uh, CP, this is from Ian McKay. CP has told the STB that it will, it will preserve gateways to KCS. How is that going to be done? So that's a concern that a lot of shippers and other railroads have uh, concerns over. But for me, what it, I'm going to use an example from ag, what it goes back to is that liquidity within the market. It really opens up a lot of gateways, for, a lot of uh, options for customers. Um, like, for example, coming out of an ethanol plant, you have your ethanol and your co-products of PDGs. PDGs, if we were to just offer options out of the origins that we serve down into Mexico or into the chicken feedlots of the KCS area, but not over into West Texas, we, CP would actually shrink the pie if we did that. Um, that's a core fundamental belief that I have and also along with some of our customers. And so when we offered Rule 11 pricing to Kansas City or through rates all the way into some other destinations with um, partner railroads like a CPKC or wherever else, we've actually seen the pie grow. So it's beneficial for us, it's beneficial for customers, and I think that's how we would try to do it. Uh, does that answer your question, Ian? Yep, thank you. Uh, this is from Chris. Um, he, had a, he had a question regarding the CPKCS map on slide 11 of, of John's presentation. What do the colors represent? <laughs> I think the graphic designer just chose them. 
uh, to be absolutely honest. So <laughs> I couldn't tell you. <laughs> when the presentations come out, uh, hopefully that'll that'll become clear. But you can get a hold of John if if you need more clarity. Is that all right, John? If I had to guess, I would say the, the blue circle was in the Canadian prairies, the green circle was in the U.S. Yeah. upper plains, the oranges or reddish circles were on the southern plains of the U.S., and then the yellow ones were in Mexico. Yeah, it's it's in smaller print. But this, this one is from Octavio Arellano, um, and it's to everyone, but specifically, Kevin, why do you think shippers in Asia the US and Canada would prefer to use the corridor instead of their own closer logistical options. Well, and I, I believe Diane spoke to that uh, with one of the earlier replies. I think right now utilizing the USMCA corridor and uh, utilizing the North American supply chain versus going overseas, we have a greater ability to, to avoid what we've recently seen with price increases coming from overseas where we, we could essentially and, and unfortunately have a collapse of the supply chain, where when a project such as this, if it was already in place, I don't, I don't think we would have seen the same ramifications that we've seen as of recent. I, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, next question uh, is from Harry Siemens. If not in order, let me know, but there's much concern or discussion about thousands of truckers not getting vaccines and not driving trucks across the border as of 2022, how do the panelists see that affecting the transportation supply chain? I'll start with Diane. Sorry. <laughs> well, I think it is gonna have an impact, no doubt. And I, my, my husband happens to work in, in the trucking industry and they, he is vaccinated by the way. Um, the, we're, they're already seeing rates go up. And I think that is going to be one of the near term implications because there isn't going to be uh, the same a number of drivers that are willing to cross, you know, that are that are going to go south um, or come north um, specifically. So I think there's going to be rate increases. And I also think it presents a, a greater opportunity for rail. So you may see some mode shifts. So th that'll be my two answers and and potentially more delays. So. It's not good. It's the short. It's not good if you're a shipper. John. Uh, we've seen a lot more rate requests come in for cross-border traffic, uh, in particular, specifically because of this. Uh, one of the issues we have, though, is a lot of the uh, ultimate destinations for, let's say, feed products going north into Manitoba. Uh, the destinations are not necessarily rail served. So we're trying to connect um, origins with rail served destinations and then working out trucking options to get them to their final destinations. But we're absolutely seeing more of it try to convert to rail. Yeah, that, I've heard much the same. Uh, next question is from Mario Rodriguez Montero. Uh, is CP interested in, in investing in the TMEC corridor projected railway segment from Sinaloa to Durango since that's kind of the missing link? Do you, any comment on that, John? I don't at this time. Um, it appeared that it connected, and I, I was quickly Googling as much as I could there as Kevin was presenting to learn more about it, but it appeared that it connected very well with the FXE, and I wasn't necessarily sure how it connected with the KCSM quite yet, but I, I can circle back with Kevin on that. Okay. Um, next question is uh, from Barry. Um, Kevin, um, this is a new con container port design. Has it ever been done anywhere else in the same manner that you're you portrayed here, or is this a brand new idea? So this is a Caxor designed port, and it's a great question. We get asked this question quite often. It's a Caxor designed port, um, as we saw it on a very very large scale with ensuring that we minimize as much environmental impact as possible. And um, it, 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 it's something that uh, Caxor has been working on for quite some time and something that, that Caxor is very proud of to be able to bring this to, uh, to the West Coast. Now, the next question is from Javier Planet, Planinich. 
Um, there's a dotted line to Churchill, Manitoba. Is there a plan to extend the corridor to Churchill and, and use the port eventually, thanks to climate change? Um, I guess that's in both Diane's and John's maps. I, I don't know if he intended it for Kevin, given the connectivity, but uh, right now, Winnipeg is connected by rail to the Port of Churchill. It just takes a dipsy doodle route through Saskatchewan. Um, and the port is operational, um, although it's had a change of ownership over the last few years and change of ownership yet again. So I'm not a, I'm not a expert um, in current status, but the, the, right now, most of the freight that moves up to the north um, is actually trucked to Thompson and transloaded there to go on the Hudson Bay Rail up to the Port of Churchill or to the northern communities. Um, I can't speak, I'm, I'm not well positioned to speak on behalf of, of the Arctic Gateway Group and what their longer term plans are. Um, I personally would love to see it augmented. I think there's opportunities. And certainly Northern distribution is an area of great concern and, and particularly with global warning, warming. And Dr. Prentice also has a, his own, another solution uh, beyond rail uh, for that. And again, I won't speak on his behalf, but it, uh, it is being utilized um, elsewhere. So there, I think there's, there's gonna be a lot of change over the next few decades in that regard. Thanks, Diane. Um... This is, this is uh, from, from uh, Martin Cash. Um, and th this is a question for Ke Kevin. He's asking, what's the order of magnitude investment that TMEC is imagining for the Winnipeg port, for center port? Do you think this is going to have an influence, I suppose, is what he's asking. Specific to Winnipeg uh, inland port itself? Yes. Approximate numbers right now, and as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're in a process of finalizing the master plan. We're somewhere in the range of about 300 to 330 million US dollars for, for that specific port. Yeah, thanks, thanks Kevin. Uh, this is from Chris Ferris. He's, uh, and I think this is just a comment, but he's thinking that adding network nodes and capacity is good for the network and its resiliency. Demand for shipping continues to grow and regional congestion or climate problems. To see TMEX corridor is benefiting the entire network is his point. Um, this is from Headley, Headley Alt. Uh, what entity or private or public is proposing to make the investment to open the rail link to Mazatland? And what is the scale of that kind of investment? The scale of the investment specific to the rail, as mentioned, were approximately 330 million. In regards to, I, I believe the question was who, which contractors will be building it, Mark? Uh, I think it's who's, who's, who's funding it, the investment. So right so now- it, Head, Headley, you're there. Um, if you could unmute. Yeah, hi, it just, it's which institution? What is the, 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 uh... Uh, I, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the, the Mexican railway structure as to whether this is going to be a state railway that is concessioned out. Is it, a, it is a, going to be a concession like some of the other uh, uh, Mexican railways and uh, it would be the concessionaire that would be making that investment or is it a state investment? At this point here, it's uh, the, the concessionaire would, would, would be. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Octavio again. When is the TMEC corridor business plan going to be presented to a broader technical audience in order to really evaluate if it's feasible or only another irrealistic idea? A non federal authority has been formally approached, or has the authority been approached? Yeah, multiple authorities have been approached, and we're in conversations with all the governing. Uh, 
governing bodies, and we've been so for, for quite some time now, in regards to a full disclosure package, um, a person only has to request uh, that right from our from our head office in Mexico City. And uh, once uh, once it's no longer deemed confidential, I'm sure that it'll be made available to a broader audience. Okay. All right. I think I've covered all the questions. I don't see any hands up. Um, Barry, we might be giving you another 10 minutes here. Well, that'd be great. But I do have a question for Kevin. You know, you talk a lot about the inbound containers and we can all see that. What do you see as the outbound freight uh, through that port? Uh, where would you draw from, mainly Mexico or Southern US? Or do you see even coming out of Canada going through that gateway? I, I think at a very high level, Barry, I would like to see it coming from, from, from Canada, obviously in the United States and definitely from Mexico. Um, I, think, I think as we've seen right now, there, there's, a, there's a very large opportunity for Canada to not only be able to increase their exports into Mexico, but also be able to use the same port to access um, additional countries within Pacific Rim. Um, to, to increase Mexico's exports both north as well as to the Pacific Rim countries is, is another desire that we want to do. But the, the main focus being the North American supply chain where we're, we're able to bring in and uh, import and export as, as a continent. Do you have any comment on the time for shipments coming through your port in competition with, say, other ports? Uh, you have a little bit shorter rail distance, certainly to Texas. Uh, it looks like you have a rail advantage uh, versus LA. Uh, do you have any sort of estimates of days and, and times? I do, but not with me, and I do not want to misspeak, Barry. <laughs> Fair enough. I appreciate that. My apologies. Well, I think that we've covered off. It was a good discussion here at the end. Um, once again, I would like to thank our three presenters. Uh, it was truly an interesting session. Um, if there's, you know, last call for anybody who's got a question. Uh, well, if that's it, I guess we get an early quit of nine minutes, Barry. Well, you know, it's extra time for everybody to go and make a peanut butter sandwich, I guess. Uh, my idea is, and I, I should turn this to Headley, because I believe you're chairing the next session, Headley, and we're starting at 1230. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Let's cut. Let's take a break for lunch and then come back at 1230 and we'll begin the next session. Uh, and don't miss it, everyone, because uh, we're actually going to hear from uh, people from Mexico. And, and this is a wonderful opportunity to get a, a look at the North America from the southern eyes. We, we often tend to look south, uh, especially this year as I look outside and see snow on the ground, my thoughts turn to Mexico, but uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what the Mexicans think looking north to us. So uh, please uh, uh, be uh, prompt to come back at 1230 because we want to make sure we hear the entire presentation. And thank you very much, Mark, for chairing this and to our speakers for having done a great job. It, it's certainly exciting uh, to see the, the rail links developing and, and from an environmental perspective as well, this is certainly good news. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bert. Thank you.